Welcome to the first entry in our series of media casts featuring published articles in Psychology of Women Quarterly. My name is Jan Yoder and I'm editor of PWQ. Our goal with this series is to bring our well-vetted research to life and to help you to put it to good use. In this series, you'll find information to use in college classes, to inform therapy practice, to help policymakers work for women, and to give you insights into your everyday life. We at PWQ, along with our partner Sage Publishing, are excited to kick off this series with the first winner of our newly created Georgia Babladilis Best Paper Award. This paper was published in the March 2011 issue, and it is entitled, When What You See Is What You Get, The Consequences of the Objectifying Gaze for Women and Men. The authors of this paper are Sarah Gervais at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Teresa Vesho at Penn State University, and Jill Allen, also at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. To tell us about their work, I am pleased to have Dr. Sarah Gervais with us today. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Jan. Um, I'm very, very excited to be here talking with you about my work today. And I just, along with my co-authors, I'm so honored to be the first recipient of the Georgia Babaladelis Best Paper Award. Let me start by asking you, Sarah, to briefly describe your study and what you found. In this study, we were looking at the objectifying gaze. And what I mean by that um, was basically this behavior that men sometimes engage in, in which they visually inspect women's bodies or stare at their body parts. And sort of a slang term for that um, is checking women out. And in this study, we looked at the consequences of the objectifying gaze. And what we did was we brought men and women into the lab and had them experience the objectifying gaze from an opposite sex partner. Um, and then we measured their math performance, their sort of desire or motivation to interact with that person, um, and their body image concern. We found that the objectifying gaze caused decreased math performance for women, but somewhat ironically, we also found that the same women that were objectified also wanted more interaction with the person that had objectified them. And this is ironic because um, those people that are causing them to underperform, they're also wanting to interact with them more in the future. Um, surprisingly, we did not find that body image concerns were affected by this sort of one instance of the objectifying gaze. So where did you come up with the concept of the objectifying gaze? Well, the objectifying gaze has been a concept that's been around for a long time. Um, Jean Kilborn, um, Mulvey, they talked about the objectifying gaze in the media, basically this notion um, that people tend to focus on, or the camera lens tends to be focused on, um, women's body parts and their bodies rather than their faces or their entire bodies. And feminist scholars and psychologists have basically said that the objectifying gaze is sometimes displayed at women um, when other people are sexually objectifying them. And what I mean by sexually objectifying um, is that they're basically reducing a woman to her sexual body parts or her appearance. Um, so basically they're valuing a woman's appearance more so than um, her other attributes. And the objectifying gaze is one indicator of sexual objectification. Now, when we think about sexual objectification, clearly things like sexual assault, sexual harassment are sexually objectifying. Um, but recently, we've become really interested in these sort of more subtle behaviors, um, like the objectifying gaze or appearance commentary, that might also be indicators of sexual objectification. So what does this gaze look like? Well, <laughs> I mean, in the laboratory, it's, as you might imagine, relatively sort of difficult to get people to gaze at other people. So what we did um, in this study is we trained confederates, and those are people that are sort of in on this study. We trained them to visually scan women's bodies and then to stare at their chests um, when they were interviewing them. And again, we did this also to men. So we're fortunate to have a video clip from your actual study. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on? Sure. As you can see in the video, we brought participants into our laboratory um, and then we brought a confederate of the opposite sex um, and they sort of entered the room and they visually scanned the participant's body and then they sat down and they were seated about two feet away from each other and they um, asked five interview questions and before and, asking, and after asking the first, third and fifth interview question, 
um, they stared at the participant's chest. Can you tell me about a situation in which you succeeded at something that was important to you? And you'll see, this is a subtle sort of gaze. It's not that they're just looking there for 10 seconds, but they're briefly gazing before and after asking those questions. And then they left the room and following sort of the gaze manipulation, they also received feedback, the participant, um, that they were focused on the participant's looks um, rather than their responses. And of course, we had a control condition in which the Confederate main maintained eye contact with the participant and where they made response responses on the basis of what they were doing rather than how they looked. Your findings are interesting both for what they show and for what they don't show. On the face of it, we would think that women being subjected to the male gaze would feel worse about their own body. Why do you think you didn't find this outcome? Well, it was su surprising, I'll be honest about that. Um, we thought that when they were ex um, experienced the objectifying gaze that women re would report more body dissatisfaction, more shame about their bodies, and be more concerned with how they looked. Um, but when you think about it in context, this was the effect of sort of one objectifying situation. And women experience objectification all the time um, and really feel generally very dissatisfied with their bodies. So it's somewhat not surprising that one instance of the objectifying gaze, and again, it was relatively benign, there was, um, you know, you're looking good is not a real big compliment and it's not critical either. So the fact that we didn't find the body image concerns was surprising, but it is consistent, you know, with theory of normative discontent, which is um, the idea that women are generally dissatisfied with their bodies. And we did find that women compared to men reported being unhappy with their bodies, um, being more shameful, and um, thinking about the way they looked a lot more than men. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. You also found that the gaze does not affect men in the ways that it affects women. We are hearing more and more about the objectifications of men's body and the ideal of the muscular, beefy guy. Mm -hmm. Why do you think women's gaze doesn't seem to have the same impact on men as men's gaze has on women? Well, you're absolutely right. In the media, we are seeing a lot more objectification of men. It's very different, I would say, than the objectification of women because, again, um, women are expected to be thin and hourglass shaped, whereas men are expected to be muscular. Um, the different thing about the objectifying gaze and objectification of men and women is really when you focus on a woman's appearance and objectify her, it, the focus is truly just on her appearance and it comes at the cost of some of her other attributes. Whereas for men, when you focus on their appearance, you can focus on their appearance but also appreciate that they you know, might be competent um, and may be powerful in other domains. In fact, when you think about the muscular ideal, achieving the muscular ideal really requires a lot of time and energy and effort. Um, whereas achieving a thin ideal, you're basically not eating, you're not doing something. It, it really is not related to um, being engaging in action whatsoever. Oh, yeah, right. So in, in one case, men are more an instrument for their bodies while women are an object. So yeah, it really and does. we also find, we find that when, you know, when people focus on women's appearance, they don't view women as very competent. But when they focus on men's appearance, they still view them as very competent. Sure, sure. Now you have some pretty fascinating non-finding. Let, let's turn our attention to some of your findings. Um, your findings about disrupted math performance and the willingness for women to keep interacting with these men um, seems more subtle than the obvious, but now we know not supported um, outcome of body dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. Thus the impact of the male gaze seems much more insidious yet with some very serious consequences for women, consequences that fit with other research on stereotype threat. What is stereotype threat, and how does your study both fit with and extend research findings in that area? Well, stereotype threat is basically this idea um, that people that are negatively stereotyped, they're pretty much aware of these stereotypes. And when they come to mind, they get concerned or worried um, that they might um, inadvertently confirm the stereotype through their performance. And this causes a host of consequences. It actually causes decreased performance in the domain of interest. It also causes concerns about whether they belong to that domain. And what we think is going on here is that sexual objectification or the objectifying gaze um, is eliciting stereotype threat in women because it basically conveys that a woman's looks or appearance um, is valued or more important to, in the other person's eyes than their other attributes. 
And what we find and what we, we think it's due to stereotype threat um, is that that leads to decreased math performance, which is very consistent with a stereotype threat explanation. And somewhat ironically, but also consistent with a stereotype threat explanation, um, we find that they report increased interaction motivation, which if they're concerned about belonging to that domain, it's not surprising that they feel like they, they need to do things um, to sort of further and get back and belong in that domain. And as you sort of um, inferred, it is very, very insidious because Again, it's just a little look or maybe a, just a little comment about appearance. It's not something that's very blatant where people are saying, we don't want woman, women in this domain. But it's these subtle things that can lead women to feel like they don't belong and ultimately lead to decreased performance. Um, and this could explain, for example, decreased performance of women and girls in math domains. Very interesting. So what are the implications of your work for future researchers? Where's your research team headed next? Oh, we are very, very excited about this research. Um, first, because it is the sort of first research to directly examine the consequences of the objectifying gaze. Other studies have measured the objectifying gaze, um, or they've um, looked at the anticipated gaze, but this is really the first research to directly examine the immediate consequences of the gaze. And we have several studies that are currently going on in our lab um, the first that we're looking at um, is how the objectifying gaze influences women in more workplace settings. Um, and specifically, we're looking at whether and when the objectifying gaze might be considered sexual harassment. Um, and we are arguing and looking at in the study whether if you increase the objectifying gaze or increase the length of the objectifying gaze, um, whether that might be considered sexual harassment from both experiencers and observers of the gaze. Um, we're also looking at this in the context of STEM domains. And what I mean by STEM domains are those science, technology, engineering, and math domains that girls and women are not um, reaching the same levels as boys and men in. And we're looking at whether some of these objectifying gazes might influence their performance, girls' and um, women's performance in these domains. And finally, although we did not find that the objectifying gaze influenced men's um, performance and interaction motivation in this study, we think there are some situational features um, that might lead to stereotype threat for men as well. For example, um, if we had men objectify other men, that could lead to stereotype threat and it could lead to efforts to restore their masculinity because they don't want to be treated in a way that um, women are treated. So I'm looking forward to seeing more of your work in PWQ. Oh, thank you. I, I, I hope I publish more of my work in PWQ. It'd be great to have you. <laughs> so how about for students and teachers in college classes? Anything they can do to make testing situations more fair? The best probably possible way to do that would be to get rid of all interpersonal interaction that you could have. Um, obviously, that's not, a very, um, that's not a very doable option. Um, however, when you think about these types of behaviors, making people aware that they might be engaging these behaviors and that they could be harmful um, is a first step toward reducing these behaviors in these types of domains. And then what might both everyday men and women do to reduce the negative consequences of objectifying women's bodies? I would say, again, the first sort of step toward doing that would be to identify the objectifying gaze in the first place. Again, because people might do it inadvertently. Sometimes it's more motivated, sometimes it's not. Um, but you can sort of get away with it in some ways. You know, it's just sort of glancing at someone's body parts or not looking at their faces. Um, and I think we first need to identify that this is a problem and then teach people, girls and women, as well as boys and men, um, how to sort of confront these instances. Because it's a little bit more challenging to confront something like a look um, versus something that someone says. Um, but I think we, you know, have some instances, for example, in the media where women confront this. You know, a typical example of sexual objectification is, you know, a man staring at a woman's breasts and then she says, hey, I'm up here, and she focuses his attention on her face. And although I wouldn't suggest doing that confrontation in all instances, things like that um, might, might actually reduce some of the um, objectification consequences. So Sarah, thanks to you and your colleagues for sharing your work with us today. My guess is that lots of our viewers are now going to be looking to read your full article. Well, I'm very excited again um, to be sharing and talking about the research. And thanks so much for having me here. And thanks to those of, of you who joined us today. You'll find Sarah's article in the 2011 March issue of Psychology of Women Quarterly, as well as on our website. 
Also on our website, you'll find other media um, casts and more information about Psych of Women Quarterly. Please go to pwq.sagepub.com. Thank you.